state may call its next witness. Your Honor, at this time, the state would rest. Members of the jury, the state has rested its case. That means that the state has completed its presentation of evidence in this case. That also means they believe they have proven the case beyond any and all reasonable doubt. This is the case against Chad Isaac in North Dakota. He is charged with quadruple murder. Quadruple murder. Four victims in this case. And the real uh, challenge for prosecutors has been linking this defendant directly to the crime scene, to the victims. And today, um, some testimony about orange fibers. Take a listen. Now, did you find similar light orange polyester fibers on any of the other items that you received for testing or any of the unknowns? I did. Um, I found fibers like these uh, from the black T-shirt, or the, I should say the tape lifts of the black T-shirt, the tape lifts of the maroon sweatshirt, and the tape lifts of the Ford F-150, as well as the gloves that were identified as belonging to Mr. Isaac. Did you find any of these orange fibers in the RJR vehicle? I did, uh, on the tape lift from the armrest. And did you find any of these orange fibers, these light orange fibers, on William Cobb's clothing? Yes, on his shirt. And how about on Lois Cobb's clothing? On her blouse. What about Robert Fockler? On his coat, his sweatshirt, and his jeans. And what about Adam Fear? Did you find any of these light orange fibers on his clothing? Yes, on his sweatshirt. So as the light orange polyesters from that known ski mask, you found that there were consistent fibers on each of the victims? Yes, I did. And as well in the RJR vehicle? Yes. And in Chad Isaac's vehicle and his effects? Yes. Let's bring in Core TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter joining us live tonight from Mandan, North Carolina. Chanley, great to see you. The orange fibers, okay. How unique are they, and, and, and what does this mean? Give us the big picture of what these orange fibers do for the prosecution. There's a reason they culminated their case in chief with the trace forensic expert, Vinny, because she was really confident in tying those items found in the dryer of Chad Isaac's home, that orange ski mask, the orange hooded sweatshirt, those fibers are on the victim's bodies inside the RJR truck that was stolen from the scene and in Chad Isaac's Ford F-150 and on his person. So again, she's saying these are exact fiber matches. They're indistinguishable. And I was in the courtroom during this testimony and it really seemed to be resonating with the jurors. This is this is what jurors these days love. They, they, they like this kind of evidence. This is what they almost expect prosecutors to be able to present, and despite the fact that they're very small fibers. Um, did the defense have any comeback for this? They tried. In fact, it became a bit contentious on the cross-examination. The defense attorney, Luke Heck, and this forensic expert, at times she questioned his questioning, saying many times, I don't know what you're talking about, trying to make out like he wasn't making sense, and it garnered some laughs from the gallery, and even the jurors chuckled at some of their exchanges. But I think it became so heated because there really wasn't any meat to the cross. It was basically picking apart her expert reports that she wrote and the methodology, her testing methods and the reliability of it, and some of the factors maybe she took into consideration or not. But again, it was a little argumentative and contentious, and it really didn't seem to be resonating with those jurors. Okay, another expert, Arnold Esposito, also testifying, talking about some ballistics. Let's listen to his direct examination. When you look back at the cartridges that we've previously talked about, um, that you said had similar characteristics to both the fired bullets and the shell casings, were you able to determine whether those cartridges would be able to be chambered in an LCR Ruger revolver? They could be fired in an LCR 38 special revolver. That's correct. All right, sounds fine on direct, but then on cross-examination, um, not so great. Take a listen. Here on the, on the front, the data that you plugged into the GRC database, you received back 101 hits, correct? Yeah, I didn't count them all, but um, I'll, I'll take your word for it. I... Okay, it looks like it's on, it, it, on the front page of the okay. report. 
Yes. Okay. And as uh, the state indicated, you went through then that list and marked, based on your expertise, certain of these 101 firearms that you personally excluded. Yes. So the GRC database, based on the information that you feed into it, excludes a whole universe of firearms, condenses it down to just this listing, correct? Yes, and this was based on the 38 caliber class search, not a 38 special search, which would be more specific. Fair, yep. yeah. And, and from there, then after the GRC database narrows it down to this list, then based on your many years of training and experience, you narrow it down further, fair? Yes. Okay, and ultimately conclude that 76 different firearms could have fired the victim bullets. Correct? That's right. Okay. So, Chanley, am I correct? Not quite as strong as the fiber evidence here. Not quite as strong, not too hurtful, though, because it is possible that those eight projectiles found in the bodies of the victims could be shot from those shell casings found at Chad Isaac's home and in the gun parts found at his home. But on cross, the defense really making some headway, saying it could have been multiple guns that shot these bullets at the victims, and they aren't exact matches. They may be similar, but you can't say for sure. All right, let's bring in our think tank, get a little bit of analysis of, of what Chanley has told us here tonight. And Bremner, Michael Sterling, Al Wunsch uh, with us. Al, um, the orange fibers seem kind of strong to me. Uh, you know, we see the video of him wearing the orange. He's got the orange at home, and the orange is on the victim. It's in the, it's in the vehicles. This is a big problem for the defense, I think. I, I have to agree. It is a big problem for the defense. And, and, you know, one of the things that the defense has to do, because they don't have a motive, and that's the one thing that's been universal in this case, is try to destroy the technical evidence and go after the experts. That's why they did a nice job with regards to the gun expert. Um, but the fibers is going to be a real tough sell. Um, I think that that is pretty strong. It is pretty calculated, and it's going to be a hard thing to overlook. But you know, then what you do is then you go to the next level, which is, well, let's attack the, the weaponry and then attack how the uh, this this testing was done. So, you know, there is a room to move on it, but I have to agree that the fibers are going to be something that are going to come back to uh, haunt the defense with regards to this case, uh, even though they don't have a so-called motive involved. But, yeah. Michael Sterling, it's amazing how... A, a small, I mean, tiny little piece of evidence, a little fiber can loom so large inside the courtroom. Yeah, absolutely, Vinny. I mean, uh, when there is no physical evidence at all uh, attaching a, a defendant or someone I'm representing the accused to a crime, obviously that's something that I'm going to stress to the jurors, that there is no physical evidence. And here you actually have at least some tangible physical evidence uh, that the prosecutors can really hone in on, uh, and you've got a base to match it from, and then you actually determine that there's a match Obviously, you can question the science behind it, uh, the methodologies that were used, but still, that is going to be some strong evidence if the jurors believe that his, you know, sweatshirt matched what was on those bodies, uh, and uh, th that's going to be a problem for defense attorneys to, to bring this case home. And Bremner, as we look in the video, face is covered, so we he can't be identified that way. They've got to do it a different way. Is this going to be enough to get it to that burden that prosecutors carry into the courtroom? Vinny, I think this is really a symphony of forensic evidence, blood, fibers, bleach. I've got the video, you've got his demeanor not in wanting to smile from a camera, the fibers connected to all the victims, the Luger, the consistent nine casings with the nine bullets at the scene, connected to his house, the washing machine, the knife bent in a way that was consistent with what happened at the crime scene. Jurors, like you said, love this kind of evidence. And this this case, with the crescendo at the end of this really compelling fiber evidence, the orange, I mean, that going to all four victims and microscopically, excuse me, similar to, of course, what they had um, at the scene. It's just amazing what they put together. What an impressive prosecution based on forensic science. And, they, and they've taken their time and they've, they've built that case. Let's bring back mm -hmm. in Chanley Painter because prosecutors rested today. That means tomorrow it's about the defense. They don't have to 
put on one witness. They don't have to prove anything. We know that, Chanley. But what do we expect from the defense? Well, the defense attorneys told the judge this afternoon, Vinny, they plan to take at least half of the day tomorrow for their case in chief. And I've scoured the witness list. It could include all those with motives, those names we've been hearing in cross-examination, the defense opening statement. You know, Robert Faulkner was having an affair at the time that he was murdered, but also maybe some patients of the doctor, the chiropractor, neighbors of the chiropractor, possibly even the chiropractor. We'll just have to wait and see. But the state expects to put on a rebuttal case in the afternoon, Vinny, and then closing.